Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see you this morning. Welcome to Common Core Baptist Church. My name is Jamie Allen. I'm glad to welcome you. See you smiling faces. Uh, I've got just a couple of announcements for you about to take care of. Uh, tonight, uh, first of all, Firefighters 5 o'clock. Uh, Master's hands at 4 o'clock. Those are reports we're getting closer and closer to Christmas. Uh, men's, men's group tonight will meet out in the fellowship hall. We're going to have a time of fellowship with Chili. Youth room. Youth room. Sorry. Youth room. Uh, with Chili and testimony. Uh, brought by Brian Hunt. We're excited to hear that. And women will be meeting in the fellowship hall uh, for a time of Friendsgiving. Uh, both of those are mentioned in the bulletin if you need to see the details there. Uh, Wednesday, we will have a community-wide Thanksgiving service at Bostick First Baptist. That's at 7 o'clock. Uh, they'll have a joint choir, so we, we invite you to be part of that. Uh, uh, and other than that, please see your bulletin for the other any other announcements uh, that we have for you this morning. I'd like to share a scripture with you. Uh, Psalms 100 says, Be thankful, a psalm of thanksgiving. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. His people, the sheep of His pasture, enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good and His faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. Father God, we're just so thankful to you this morning, God. Just thank you for everything you do for us. God, we love you. We know we don't deserve your love in return. But you chose us. God, you do all for us because you are so great. I just pray that through this service that we bring glory to your name, uh, that we're a witness to you through our actions, our words, and our song. And that, God, you will be glorified in all that we do here. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Stand with me as we sing all in all. <clears throat> Thank you. 
the day. I asked me to speak a little bit this morning about Operation Christmas Child because the youth are going to go to um, volunteer at the Processing Center in Charlotte on Wednesday. We actually just had a couple spots open up, so if you want to go, you can let me know today. Um, but I wanted to uh, just tell you a little bit of history about um, Operation Christmas Child, which I learned a few things. Um, Operation Christmas Child was started in 1993. I had to have went to the Boone Processing Center just a couple years after that. So one of the first few years the Boone Processing Center was open, I went and volunteered. Um, I, was at, I was in high school at the time. But it was started in 1993 um, when a man from England called Franklin Graham and said that there's children in war-torn Bosnia um, that are not going to get anything for Christmas, and is there anything that, uh, that they could do? So. Um, Franklin Graham called a friend who was a pastor at Calvary Church in Charlotte. So Operation Christmas Child started right here in North Carolina. Um, and so he talked to them and said, will you fill a shoebox and then take it to your church? Um, show it to your congregation and see if they'll have some shoeboxes. Um, that year, Calvary packed 11,000 shoeboxes. Um, and that was the first year uh, that Operation Christmas Child was um was in operation. Um, they joined with uh, some people in Canada, and so they sent a total of 28,000 shoeboxes to the um, children in Bosnia. So that's that's how Operation Christmas Child got started. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, it's gotten a lot bigger now. Um, so as of last year, um, they celebrated the 200 millionth shoebox that was packed in Charlotte. Um, and so, uh, in Charlotte last year, they had a special ceremony for the 200 millionth shoebox. Franklin Graham came, um, had the lady that was there from Calvary, which packed one of the very first shoeboxes to come um, and uh, place something in the shoebox. Uh, they prayed over that shoebox and then they followed it. And that shoebox was actually delivered by hand to a little girl in the Ukraine. Um, total last year uh, in the United States, there were over 9.3 million shoeboxes packed. Um, and then that combines with other countries, and so a total of 10.6 million shoeboxes were packed last year across the world. And they go to over 170 countries and territories. Um, so the shoeboxes are, are gifts. But they have also expanded it now, and so um, the shoeboxes go into these countries that they're allowed to go to. Um, and every shoebox <laughs> represents an opportunity to share the gospel. Um, and so they have a discipleship course that they, um, that they can go over. Uh, they have, um, it's called The Greatest Journey. And so um, they take the shoeboxes to these local churches, and then they uh, give them this 12 lesson discipleship course um, and share the gospel with these children as they get their shoe boxes. Um, now, some of the countries that they go to, they can't really do a whole lot by way of sharing the gospel. Um, these, uh, we've, these are called special processing boxes. I've helped process those boxes before. Um, it's, it's sad, but um, it's, it's a need. It's, it's the way that they're able to get into the country. And so they have certain specifications. You can't have anything that has anything about Christmas in it. You can't have anything that in the box that has anything about Jesus in it. Um, there's so many things that can't go in these boxes, so they're very, they're very generic boxes. But that at least gets them in the door to these countries uh, where they wouldn't even be able to get in the door. And that's still allowing them maybe not to share the gospel as widespread in the countries where they're open. Um, but in these, in these countries, that at least gets them in the door. And so they have special processing shoeboxes uh, for those countries. And then the open countries, um, people put anything in there um, as far as, like, Jesus loves you. Sins, uh, you can put Bibles in there. You can put, um, you know, anything about Christmas in there. So um, it's, it's really neat to go if you've never went and volunteered at the uh, processing center. Um, you can go online and volunteer for a volunteer shift. They get taken up really, really quickly, especially if you have a big group. But if you just have like one or two people in your family that want to go for a couple hours, it's it's something to it's something to see. 
Um, and every so often they stop and they pray over they pray over the boxes. And so you stop what you're doing and you put your hand on the closest box you can get to and you pray over the boxes um, because these boxes represent the gospel going into the hands of children all over the world. So um, I think we've got some boxes down front during prayer time. We're going to uh, dedicate the boxes. Sing with me again as we sing 519, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and 
Hymn 76, For the Beauty of the Earth. We'll sing two verses on His Grand Thine Faithfulness and three on For the Beauty of the Earth. <laughs>
building, but you can see him through other people or even you can see him through a shoebox or a backpack.
loves this church family, loves their children, loves serving the Lord. Amen? Amen. Um, I hope you have your Bibles with you as we enter into the week of Thanksgiving. Man, are you thankful for God's Word? Yes. If you are, I know, I know you are, whether, whether you have your Bible or not, but I hope you do. Hold it up with me. Say this with me. When I open the Bible, when God opens His mouth. It's not just what God has said. It is what God is saying. I hope you believe that this morning. As we come to our uh, time in God's Word, the title of our message today is called The Upside Downers. And uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. So flip on over to Acts chapter 17. The Upside Downers. I was going to try to get all the way through chapter 17 uh, today, but it, it's not going to happen. So we're going to have a part one and part two this week, and then we'll do part two next week of chapter 17. But last week we finished up Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas, if you remember, they were on their second missionary journey. And of course, they were confronted by multiple accounts, I mean on multiple accounts, but they were, they were prayed up, they were powered up, because God, the God uh, of the universe moved in mighty ways. We noted that prayer and praise petition for God's power. Amen? Paul and Silas, they were imprisoned in the most secure uh, area in the prison. They began to praise the Lord. And what did God do? If you remember, he opened up the doors and broke the shackles off. Not just some of them, not just Paul and Silas, but he broke the shackles off of everyone. But rather than leaving right away, they stuck around to evangelize to the prison guard. Oh man, what a, what a wonderful story it was. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 34, it said he brought them, talking about the prison guard, he brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Apparently, after the meal, they went back to the jail together because the Bible says that the next morning, the officers told the jailer that he can send word that the men can be released and go in peace. But Paul wasn't having it. They were beaten publicly without trial. So Paul had uh, the officials come and escort them out of prison themselves. And they urged them to leave town. So after leaving the jail, they went to Lydia's house and Philippi, who had just previously come to believe, and they encouraged new believers there, and then they left. And I, I think it's pretty awesome that the Lord, that, that he opened prison doors, he broke the shackles loose, not to give Paul and Silas their freedom from persecution, but rather he did it to show off his power to the jailer so he could be set free from the chains of sin and bondage and be set free from an eternity in hell. That's why God did it. And we enter into chapter 17 today, beginning in verse 1 and follows. It says, After they passed through Amphipolis, that's hard to, hard to say. After they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city, attacking Jason's house. They searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason has welcomed them. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, Jesus. The crowd, city officials who, had, who heard these things, were upset, and after taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that it is perfect. It is sharp for our lives to teach us, to 
to mold us, to rebuke and correct and move us into action. God, I pray that your word teaches us this morning as we hear it and as we receive it. And it's in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thessalonica. It was an important city. It was an important center for business at the time. It was located in a, a central area of some major trade routes. And at that time, Paul actually worked as a tent maker, but he still ministered in the synagogues on the Sabbath where he finds devoted Jews and Gentiles who are seeking God. I love where it says Paul, as usual, goes into the synagogue, right? It was a common thing for him. And we don't know how long he was actually there in Thessalonica, but we do know that on three of the Sabbaths, he reasoned with them. He opened up the scriptures before them, showing them how Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He was laying out proof after proof after proof, evidence, presenting it before them of the truth of God's word. And he gave one proof after another that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. Let me ask us all today, church, have we studied the scriptures Enough to even reason with the lost on even just a few topics. Much less many, many topics. Are we, are we versed in the scriptures enough to reason the proofs of the resurrection that we find in the scriptures? Can we present it clearly to them? The early believers were called to be witnesses to the resurrection. And, and Paul and Silas, they were certainly doing that. Acts 2.32 says, God has raised this Jesus, and we are witnesses of this. John R.W. Stott said, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. The resurrection, that's what it's about. Could we reason with the lost, a lost person, of the proof of the resurrection, of the proofs that we see, the evidence that we see in God's word that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. A big crowd came to know Jesus that day. The message that they were sharing, they began to believe it. But this message didn't sit well with everyone. No. The first thing I want us to hold on to today and walk away with is that some will resist the word of God when you share it. Some will resist. We see here in the city of Thessalonica a group who was resistant to the word. They were jealous of Paul's success, of the influence he was carrying among those in the synagogues. And quite honestly, we see the same thing today, right? We see it. We live, uh, when we live for Christ, when we preach Christ, some are going to receive the word, some are going to follow the word, and others are going to be resistant to it. I don't have anything to do with it, or just give me what I'd like to hear, and I'm going to leave the rest of it behind. Sometimes people are going to be jealous of what they have not received, jealous of the joy, jealous of the hope, jealous of the family, but unwilling to lay down their current life situation and surrender to Jesus. It's going to happen. The city officials, they, they can't find these missionaries anywhere. So they go after Jason, the host to Paul and his friends. See, Paul was proclaiming that there was another king. To be clear, he was preaching Jesus. A king and a kingdom not of this world. Jesus said of, of himself in John chapter 18, verses 36 and 37. He said, my kingdom is not of this world said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then? Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king? Jesus replied, I was born for this. I love that line, Jesus. I was born for this. I imagine him saying it in kind of a deep voice, but it's probably not, but it, I was born for this. <laughs> that, that probably wasn't how he said it. I was born for this. And I have come into this world for this. To testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So when Jesus came, he began to teach. And he began to do things upside down, right? 
A lot of things upside down. His weapons were truth and love rather than the spear and the sword. He brings people hope and peace by upsetting the status quo. Even though he surrendered to death, he conquered death through the resurrection. He even died for his enemies. He wasn't interested so much in empty religion, but rather he was interested in a relationship with him. You see, he had a way of turning things upside down. And when followers of Jesus live according to Jesus, then followers of Jesus turn the world upside down. They become upside downers. Right? It says in 17 verse 6, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. They were beginning to worry. They were concerned about the message that Paul and Silas was preaching. Somebody said one time, there are, there are people who watch things happen. There are people who make things happen. And there are people who don't know what's happening. <laughs> These were people who made things happen. Amen? Every time they took a step, the world shook. They had an effect. They mattered. Church, I want to be a Christian that turns the world upside down. And that doesn't always mean that, that I, I don't want all the attention from the masses, but rather it means that my life makes a difference for the kingdom of God. And that's all that matters. Church, we should want the devil shaking in his boots in the morning when our feet hit the floor because he realizes that we're up. We should want the devil, the demons from hell to tremble and cry, Oh no, another child of God is on the move. We should be powered by prayer and passionately pouring out our praise so that the enemies of God will think twice about attacking one who is grounded in the Lord's army. That should be who we are, church. We should want the joy of Christ reflecting on us so much so that when we are compared to the world today, it's like comparing chalk and cheese. We should march to a different beat of the drum. We should be living lives that turn the world upside down. We should be upside downers. Amen. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I can do that much. I'm just one person. Let me tell you, with the, work, with the Lord working through us, we don't have to be concerned about how small or insignificant we are. We just need to remember how big He is. Amen. We don't have to worry about what we don't have. We just remember, need to remember what he does have. We, need, we can't focus on our weaknesses. We need to fix our eyes on his great strength. At Thessalonica, the officials were resisting the word of God. But that night, Paul, Paul makes a journey heading to Berea, about 45 miles away. And there they, they, they find a group that has a different response to the word of God. Look at verse 10. It says, as soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if... These things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including the prominent, uh, a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out about the word of God that had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowds. Then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast. But Silas and Timothy stayed on there. You see, while some will resist the Word of God, some receive and study the Word of God. Let me ask this church, which one are we? Oh, what a great example we get from these Bereans. Amen? They were faithfully studying God's Word, even testing the messages that they hear. They weren't sitting back waiting to be spoon-fed like a baby in a booster seat. They were eager for the truth. They wanted it. They were willing to search for it. But of course, when God is on the move, we always see Satan is working as well. 
right? <laughs> he brings on the scene the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica, and they stirred up trouble there too. You know, some people just stir up trouble no matter where they go. You know what I'm talking about? I'm serious. I mean, some people, I'm convinced, they just like the smell of their own stench. They just stink things everywhere. It's kind of like a, a skunk. They leave a stink and then keep on and leave another stink somewhere else and then keep on. And, I mean, they can't, if they can't get the stink out of a group that they want, they just move on to another group. Right? At your school, at your workplaces, you know what I'm talking about. And your family? Uh oh, we're getting real now. <laughs> you know that one who's always trying to stir something? The one who's negative all the time? Believe it or not, it's even true in churches. I heard a story one time of three pastors. These pastors, they were buddies and they went fishing together. And all three of them had just had a revival the week before. And the first pastor said, fellas, I'm going to tell you, we had, a, we had a great revival. They said, really, really? What, what happened at your revival? He said, I'll tell you, we had two brand new members just join our church. And uh, they, they became part of the family there at our, our church. They said, oh, man, that's, that's wonderful. I, that, that's just great. Praise the Lord. The other one said, listen, I, I, I can tell you one even better. He said, we had, we had three, three new members join our church during the revival. They said, man, that's wonderful. That's a great revival. Praise the Lord. The other one said, I'll tell you what, I, I got you both beat. I said, the Lord really showed up and showed out. He moved in a mighty way. They said, really, what happened? They said, he said, I'll tell you what happened. At the end of our revival, we lost five of our worst troublemakers. <laughs> Sometimes troublemakers hardly ever go away. They just rotate churches. They just move from one place to the next. Satan also has his missionaries. And they're busy bees as well. 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15 says, For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles for Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no, it is no great surprise if his servants are also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will be according to their works. And we know that we're not saved by works, but we're only saved by grace through faith. We live in a, day, a world today where the word of God is getting twisted, right? Wrong is declared right and right is declared wrong where people are deconstructing the Bible to fit their beliefs rather than deconstructing their beliefs to match up to God's word. I once heard somebody say that whenever I open the Bible and I find something contrary to what I believe, then I have to assume that I am wrong. The enemy is deceiving people left and right, and I believe a huge reason for that church is because many people do not know the Word of God and do not study the Word of God, and therefore we cannot defend nor explain the Word of God. Oh, we say we do. We bring it on Sunday. We study some of the Word on, on Wednesday nights. But these Bereans, they were studying and examining it daily. They were hungry for the Word. Leonard says quite often that the average Christian spends more time brushing his teeth than he does reading the Word. One of the great problems with the way our culture has gone is people are hungry for the Word of God like a lion is hungry for a fruit bowl. Remember the early church in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. To the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. David said in the Psalm 1, 1 and 2, it says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. Pastor, how is, how is the word going to help me in my everyday life? 
I'll tell you how. 2 Timothy 3.16, the Word will tell us how all Scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Amen? God's Word teaches us. But sometimes we see the Word as not something to hunger and thirst for, but rather we, we see it as something that we can use when we want, something that we can just throw on a social media post or on a bracelet, but really it has no essential meaning to our lives. You see, there is a vast difference in posting the word so others will see and admire our lives versus living our lives in reflection of the word that we share. For many, the sacredness of the Bible has been diminished to merely a convenient buffet of motivation rather than that which is the perfect, holy breath of God. Church, let me just say, if we're going to be a people who turn the world upside down, if we're going to be upside downers, and we have got to receive the word with eagerness, and we've got to examine it to see if it is, what is being said is truth. People are saying that they can be Christian and still live a lifestyle of sin and God will forgive them. Well, that's not what the Word says. God will forgive them if they go and sin no more. If they would leave their lifestyle of sin, as Jesus told the woman who was caught in adultery. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. The Bible is clear that if you are living in sin, regardless of what that sin is, then you will not inherit kingdom of God. Church, we are only saved by the blood of Jesus Christ who takes away our sins. Amen? If we are followers of Christ, we need to eagerly long for and receive the full truth of God's word. You see, the word of God is, is getting twisted. It's getting ignored. Parts that, that we like are being elevated, while parts that we don't like are being swept under the rug. The good news is this. We don't have to stay in our sin. You see, when we receive the full truth, we're not only made aware of our sin and the consequences of our sin, but also, we are made aware of the good news. And the good news is we do not have to stay in our sin. Paul told the Corinthians just after he, he listed who would inherit the kingdom of God, he told them this in chapter 6, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians. He said, and some of you used to be like this. Amen? Some of you used to be like this. What's he talking about? It used to be like what? Thieves, greedy people, verbally abusive, swindlers, sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers. Some of you used to be like this. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Praise the Lord. How many of us today say, I remember what I used to be like before Christ. But I've been saved, I've been sanctified, I've been justified, and I'm continuing to be sanctified by the Spirit of God. He's still working on me. Church, if we are going to turn the world upside down, then we have got to have an eagerness for the truth of God's word. And when we are abiding in the word, then the spirit of God can use it to speak truth into people's lives so that it can change our hearts and also change the hearts of others. Last week, we looked at the power that is in prayer and praise. Let me tell you, there is great power in knowing and studying and abiding in the word of God. It's so essential and these Koreans, they set the example and they set the bar high for us. 
1 Peter 2.2 2 says, Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation. We need to grow in the truth of God's word. Amen? Amen. For every believer, that's the calling for us today. For every believer, we've got to grow in the truth of God's word. We need to have a hunger, a desire, a, thir a thirst for it. We long for it with eagerness. Let me ask you, how eager are you for God's word? Are you eager enough to read it three times a week? Four times a week? Every day like the Bereans? Do we long for the truth of God's word to be a part of our everyday lives that we meditate on it day and night? So that we think on it, we pray on it, we chew on it throughout the day? Is it empowering our spirits where we can live through the power of God? That's the call for each of us today. Because some will resist the word of God. But some will receive it with eagerness. Sometimes we need to be corrected by the Word of God. And we as believers in Christ need to be humble and accepting of that, of that correction. Because the Word of God is, it's, it's useful for correcting, for teaching, for rebuking. It helps us grow. I can tell you right now, I need correcting by the Word of God quite often. Sometimes it takes brothers or sisters to come alongside and say, now let me show you this from God's truth. So that we can sharpen one another. That's what the family of Christ is about. Growing one another, helping one another live for Christ. I pray today, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, this day will be the day. And today you'll come to Jesus and you'll say, I believe you. Jesus, you died for me. You rose for me. I want to give my life over to you. I want to be in your will, in your ways. I don't want to live for me anymore. I just want to live for you. I want to be diving into your word. I want to be spending time in prayer with you. I want to be in relationship with you, Jesus. That's what it means to surrender your life to Jesus and make him your Lord. Make him not only your Savior, Praise your Lord. Would you stand together with me? Value this. Father, I thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. I pray, God, that you would help us as people of God to hear your word, to receive it with eagerness. God, that we would desire and long for the word of God to just be ingrained upon our hearts. Lord, that we would study it, that we would examine it, that we would know it well where we can defend it. We can teach it. Or we can use it for the ways you desire the word of God to be used for. God, I pray today that there's somebody here that doesn't know you. Lord, that they would hear your truth today from your word. They would know that you are the true Messiah, the Savior. The God of the universe who took on skin, who came to this earth to live a perfect life, a sinless life, and died as a sacrifice for our sins. You paid the price that we could not pay. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as our Lord and Savior, that they would say, Lord Jesus, I need my sins forgiven. I believe you died on the cross. And I believe three days later you rose from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave, so that I too, Lord, if you conquered death, you have the power to offer eternal life, and I want to receive eternal life by surrendering my life to you. If that is you today, if that's someone here today, I pray that they would, they would turn everything over to you. God, that they would not acknowledge you as Lord and Savior, and that they would give everything over to you. Lord, we thank you for your truth. May you respond as the Lord leads. In Jesus' name. Let's sing together. If you need to make a decision, won't you come now? Won't you come to the
the altar and do business with the Lord. Receiving the word with eagerness. Travis, this one got me close. Uh, I have something to say. Uh, I spoke with Leonard Goforth on the telephone this morning, and today is Nina's birthday. Uh, she'll be 83 years old, and the flowers up here are in honor of her birthday. So uh, Nina's doing very well. Uh, she did have a great night last night. They thought that she'd go into ICU after her surgery, but she didn't have to. She got to go straight into a regular room, and she's recovering awesomely. Uh, praise the Lord. But I just hate to interrupt you, but I wanted Thank you. that to be known. Yeah, absolutely. So, praise the Lord for successful surgery, and we just continue to pray for our dear sister, Nina. Amen. Amen. All right, Jamie, would you close in prayer? Father God, I just thank you so much, Lord, for everything you do for us. God, we are just... Uh, thankful for Nina's successful surgery, Lord. We know that she still has so much ahead of her, uh, God. And we know that this whole time she's been in your arms that you're taking care of her, just like you do for all of us, God. We know that is, uh, you love us so much that you're in these situations, God, sometimes even before we invite you. And we're just so thankful for that, that we can, we can rest and relax and know that you, God, are looking after us. Uh, God, we just uh, pray that everything uh, said during the message today fell on our hearts. God, I do pray that we remember that as Christians we are uh, we are meant to hold each other accountable in love, God. You do call us to look to others and God to remind them of what the word would have to say, what your word would have to say. But God also that we do not forget that plank in our own eye, Lord, that we look at ourselves. God, and we listen to you when you're on our hearts, when you're on our mind, and when you are telling us that we are falling short, God, that we do not uh, react in a bad way, God, but we just thank you so much for letting us, reminding us uh, what we need to do for you. God, be with us through this week. Keep us safe. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.